Hi, and welcome to another introductory statistics video. In this video, we will be talking about chapter nine topics, hypotheses testing. And this is our penultimate chapter for the entire course, which means our second to last chapter. And like a good novel, we've saved, um, we kind of had the climax in this chapter. Uh, so the, the penultimate topic or whatever will be the, the highlight of the course. Um, it is challenging, so uh, the, there will be challenges to go through, but this is this is really what statistics is all about, the heart and the soul of the course. And then we've saved the best for last. We've saved a nice, sweet, not the easiest chapter in the whole course. Um, that was probably chapter one, but it's definitely easier than six, seven, eight, and nine, or six, eight, and nine for sure. Um, and probably three and four as well. Uh, so we, we're going to end on a nice note. Um, and this, I, I love this stuff too, but it is challenging. Um, but this, um, I think it just, it just leaves open so much possibilities to be able to, to take data that's just part of the sample and to make conclusions about the entire population. So I'm really excited about this chapter. Uh, so be ready with your formula card, your calculator, and your lecture notes and we will jump right in. I like to break hypotheses testing up into five different steps. And I think most textbooks do as well. They don't always have the same five steps. Um, our textbook doesn't really give steps and Newton discusses all of these elements and tests on all of these elements, but it doesn't put them together in a way that I would like to. And that's why your projects and your discussion posts will go through these five steps. I haven't labeled them as five steps, but I've definitely asked for your assumptions, your hypotheses, the test statistic and the p-value, and a conclusion statement. And so what we're going through in today's video and in the next video, the hypothesis test for proportions, all of that is going to be enormously helpful on your projects. And uh, if you're in the online course, on your discussion posts for this chapter. So we will talk about the very first part, which is actually where most students miss the most points because the assumptions, I've listed the assumptions here, but it's not enough to list the assumptions. I want you to apply it directly to whatever problem scenario you've been given. So, and tell me why that scenario meets or why it doesn't meet these assumptions. So our first assumption is kind of grayed out. It's a, it's a little bit different. Um, if you're going to do the z-test, you have to know the population standard deviation sigma. Uh, if you do not know sigma, you are not allowed to do the z-test. You do the t-test instead. So like the last chapter, four means, where we had z-interval or t-interval, when you know your population standard deviation, and that's pretty much when you're given it in the problem, uh, then you will use the z-test or the z-interval. When you don't know, um, you just use the t. So this one is not necessary if you're going to do a t-test, but it is necessary if you're going to do a z-test. So that's why it's a slightly different color here. Um, so we need to think about this one. Um, and then the second one uh, is for pretty much every single hypothesis test and confidence interval you ever do, you will need to know that you have a simple random sample, or at least a random sample. Some textbooks just say random sample, but this textbook says simple random sample. And uh, to think about this, you have to have, going back all the way to chapter one, you have to have a random number generator, and you have to use that random number generator on a list of your entire population. So you have to number your entire population, not just a subset of that population. So you can't just go like take a convenience sample at a particular location, number them, and then take a random number generator of that convenience sample because that's still a convenience sample. You have to do the entire population. So um, look at your scenario and see if you have that. Now sometimes the problems that Newton will give you and the problems from the textbook that I'm about to give you aren't aren't quite um, enough information for you to know for certain that it was a simple random sample. But if they say random, take their word for it. Um, assume that, that they actually, because they're the textbook, have checked to make sure that it is truly random. Um, I would prefer they would have given us more information to know that um, for ourselves, that we would know that it was random. Uh, and certainly in the projects, that will be your goal. You get to decide for yourself, hey, is what we did uh, really a simple random sample? 
And then the next thing, the, the last assumption that you will need to do, um, the original assumption should always be mentioned. So the original assumption is that the population distribution is approximately normal. Um, so we can waive this assumption if we um, have a, a large enough sample size. So, uh, but we need to look at the data first. So the population distribution, is it normal? So always, always, always look at the data first on your projects. That would mean looking at a histogram. And you've already produced all those histograms in the previous project. And so you can just look at your histogram for that data set and say, hey, is this, you know, not crazy skewed? Um, so this would be this would be crazy outliers. Crazy skewed or crazy outliers. And even if you had 30 data values here, you might reject this one because it's got crazy, crazy skewness. Um, this one would kind of be iffy though if you had 30 data values. I would say if you had 20 data values, definitely reject this one because of these um, extreme outliers. Um, but if you had 30, it would be on the line a little bit. Always look at your data first though. And then, uh, realize that it's actually a combination of tails. If you've got two tails, and we'll talk about tails later on, if you've got a two-tailed or a two-sided um, inference, uh, which means that uh, you're, you're gonna use the not equal to symbol. So two-sided, uh, two tails, um, shading both tails. Uh, if you have two tails, then you get more leeway here on this assumption. Uh, so you get a little more leeway. If you have a large sample size, you get more leeway. If you have um, a distribution that is close to the normal shape, then you get a lot of leeway. <laughs> um, a whole lot, actually. If it's very close, then you're done. Even if you just have two data values in your sample, you're, you're good. So it is a combination of all of these things. Um, but when, when you are bad at all of them. So you, when you have a one-sided test instead of a two-sided test, when you have a small sample size instead of a large sample size, and when you have very skewed data, um, then you should not be doing this test. Um, so that's kind of what it's telling you to look at, all of these things on that last assumption. And so jumping back into our assumptions, we are going to do example problems for each of these steps. And what I'd like for you to do is to pause the video here, read the question, and then uh, do these um, assumptions yourself. Decide if you need a Z, and if you need a Z, then you need to do this first assumption as well, um, and then definitely do the second and the third assumptions. Uh, but if you, if you don't need a Z, then you don't have to have the sigma. Uh, so pause the video now and work on these. Okay, so hopefully you paused the video and at least thought about these things. Um, so here, uh, the we only need the simple random sample and the normal population distribution because we are not given the population standard deviation, we are just given the sample standard deviation. And when you're given the sample, um, standard deviation. That's a, usually a really good indication that you're going to use the T, but you could read the rest of the problem to make sure that this is a t-test. So because this is a t-test, we did not need the first assumption. We do look at simple random sample, and remember I said that you can't just list the assumptions. You have to look here at the problem to see where it says um, or gives you information to confirm that you do in fact have a random sample. It didn't say simple, that's okay. We, we're okay if it's a cluster random sample. It has to be random. Convenience is not random, but cluster random sample, stratified random sample, uh, and the systematic random samples were all the types of random sampling that we discussed. And really any one of them is fine, even though the textbook says simple random sample. Simple random sample is probably the, the best one, um, but uh, any one of those is fine. So it, we will take it at its word that it really is a random sample, but know that if, if it didn't say it was a random sample, um, we and really, if you're looking at a research study, I would not take it at its word if it just said that. I would, I would ask why is it a random sample? How did you collect your data? And any good study should publish how they collected their data so that you can confirm that they numbered 
all of the entire population, not just a subset, but the entire population, and then used a random number generator. So uh, if they didn't do those two things, probably not a random sample. And then the uh, last assumption here, normal population distribution. Well, we're told that we have 40 players in our sample, but we aren't given the data, so we can't actually look at a histogram, which kind of sucks because um, it really you really should do that. But uh, with 40, that's just such an overwhelmingly large number uh, that we'll go ahead and say, yeah, hopefully it is not crazy skewed, not crazy outliers, and we'll go ahead and risk it. So always, if it's 30 or more and they haven't given you the data, go ahead and give it the benefit of the doubt. But if you have the data, you should always look at the data that you have. And for example, the projects, you will have the data, so you should definitely look at the data you have. And for the discussions, you will have the data. So you should look at the data that you have to see how normal it is, and that should be mentioned when you do step one. So I will be looking for you to mention why it's random and prove to me it's random, and I will be looking for you to mention um, why you have a normal population distribution. Um, or if you don't have a normal population distribution, why it's not so skewed um, that it, with a combination of the number of data values that you have, you can use to waive this assumption. So. If your, if your distribution isn't already almost perfectly normal, then, then you aren't really meeting this assumption, you're just waiving it. So this one um, can be fully met, but this one you're just kind of waiving it. In other words, you're allowing it, but it isn't fully met. And so that's step one. Moving on to step two. And so the second step, the word hypotheses, ES, that implies that there are two because it's plural instead of IS, which is singular. So we always have two hypotheses. And I like to start with the second hypothesis, and I actually call it the original hypothesis, even though it's usually presented as the second one, because it's the one that the researcher sets out to prove is true. You can never prove that the null is true, so we can never prove that the null is true. Um, we either reject it or we don't reject it, but we can't say that it's definitely true. But we can prove the alternative is true, and that's our goal. So we start out wanting to prove that our alternative is true. So we come up with some data value that we think that our mean is going to be greater than or less than or not equal to and that's what we try to prove is true and so we'll choose a data value that we think we can prove um, that it's greater than or less than or not equal to. Notice how all of the alternative hypotheses don't include equal signs because you can never prove that something is exactly equal to which is why we don't ever prove that the null is true um, because most of the time what we do once we have our alternative hypothesis is we take these symbols whichever symbol we chose and we replace it with an equal sign so the researcher is allowed to choose which of these symbols they want to use any of the three is fine as long as they don't and as long as they include these and they don't include these with the equal signs um, and then once you choose that replace it with an equal sign to get the null and that's pretty easy this textbook also does allow for um, you to use greater than or equal to as a null um, or less than or equal to as a null depending on what you used as your alternative hypothesis. So if your alternative hypothesis was strictly greater than, the exact opposite of that is less than or equal to. And so if you wanted to use a combination of this null, or this alternative with this null, you could. You couldn't use any of these other, well, I mean, you could obviously use the equals, but you couldn't use this one with this one, for instance. Um, so also this one goes with this one. Uh, because it's the exact opposite, and so you could use these two together. But for this uh, null hypothesis, you you couldn't use this one or this one, so that that wouldn't work. Um, so it has to go with these. Um, or you could just always, this is what I do, always use equals. Um, that's pretty standard as well, is to just use the equal symbol for the null hypothesis. And so now what we want to do is an example. So you can pause here and write down what you would say. Um, and here there is a specific right answer, um, so you want to try to mimic what the 
problem is telling you. And if it isn't telling you any of these symbols, um, then this one's the default because it's the stronger of the two. So if you encounter a scenario where it isn't, the problem isn't telling you any, then be sure to use this. But go ahead and pause now and look at this scenario and tell, tell write down on your notes what you think the null and the alternative hypotheses are. I usually write the alternative first and then I write the null. Okay, hopefully you've paused, uh, and this is what I've come up with. And I come up with the alternative first here too, even if I'm reading a problem, because oftentimes the last sentence will just tell you the uh, alternative hypothesis in words. Um, so do the data support the claim that the mean, that's mu, height is less than, that's our less than symbol, and so that tells us we need to be using the less than symbol um, and 73 inches. And we really could have put inches or the symbol for inches here if we wanted to. Um, sometimes I leave it off of the null and alternative hypotheses, but uh, you can put the units if you want to. Uh, what you will absolutely have to have is the null or alternative hypothesis symbol, so I want labels to tell me which one's the null and which one's the alternative. Here I have kind of two labels, labels um, one in spelled out alternative and one using the symbol for the alternative hypothesis. Um, so that's one thing that I will be looking for. The second thing I'll be looking for is the correct symbol. Here they use the word mean and so we should have the symbol for the population mean mu. So we definitely want the right symbol. Um, and this isn't talking about the sample mean either because we know exactly what the sample mean is. It is 71 inches. It's talking about the population mean mu. So we definitely want the right symbol there. Um, we want the right symbol here, um, the correct symbol here, I guess I should say. And that's going to be the less than symbol. And we want the correct value here. Um, so two, three, four, and that's just for the alternative. The null will have the same four, um, although, uh, so just changing the symbol here and changing the symbol here, um, but this uh, mu is the same and this 73 is the same as it was for the alternative. So I'll be looking for these four things in the null hypothesis and these four things in the alternative. So hopefully that all makes sense. All we had to do once we had our alternative was replace the less than symbol with our equal sign, and we were done. Uh, and now we can move on to step three. With step three, the test statistic, that means either our z-score or our t-score. Uh, so we have two choices for our test statistic. And basically, we're going back to thinking about the sampling distribution of all sample means. So this is a distribution of, uh, I've labeled two of the x-bars, but really there will be uh, maybe thousands of x-bars here. And I've labeled the mean as mu zero. And remember, that's from our hypotheses in the previous one. Our null is exactly equal to mu zero. So here, we're assuming that the null is true. So we start off assuming that our null hypothesis is true, that our population mean really is mu zero. And then what we do is we take our actual data that we have given to us in the problem or what we collected in the project or for the discussions, what we collected for that discussion post, we'll take our actual data and we will compute a z-score or a t-score for that data value. Uh, so um, this could be the, the z-score or the t-score depending on whether the problem gave us the population standard deviation or not. Most of the time in real life, we will be using the t-score because we won't know the standard deviation of the entire population. If we knew that, we would know the mean and there wouldn't be any point in doing a means hypothesis test because we would know the mean because we'd have the whole population. So um, most of the time the t-test is the one that we would use. With Newton, it uses the t-test half the time and the z-test half the time so that you can get familiar with both of those. Um, so we take the process for the t-score would be, be that we take our x bar, whatever it is, our sample mean, we take our hypothesized population mean value, we take our sample standard deviation, and we take our sample size, and we put in this formula, and of course you want to put parentheses around the numerator and the denominator anytime it's complicated when you put in the calculator. You would do exactly the same thing for the z-score um, when you have z-score ones, except you will use the population standard deviation, but the process is exactly 
the same to get your test statistic. Um, and then before we do an example, we'll talk about step four too because they're tied together. Um, and so on step four, we compute the p-value. So basically, you would take whatever your test statistic was um, and you would shade one of the tails. Um, so we may shade, we could shade all the way like this, um, or we could um, shade all the way like this. It will really just depend on, um, as the next slide tells us, our alternative hypothesis symbol. Um, so we look at our alternative hypothesis symbol. If it is greater than, we, then we shade greater than. So whenever it's greater than, we shade greater than. Whenever it's less than, we shade less than. And whenever it's not equal to, we shade both tails greater than and less than. Uh, so this kind of tells you how to how to shade stuff. Um, and so uh, that's, that's how we get our p-value. So uh, let's suppose that we shade this area right here. Um, and in that case, we would do uh, TCDF of this area. Um, or if we shaded the right tails, we would do TCDF of this area. It turns out if we shade both tails um, that we can just calculate the area of one tail and double it. So we could do TCDF of this area, or if we were doing uh, normal, if we were doing z-scores, then it would be normal CDF instead of TCDF. Um, so keep that in mind that uh, z-scores are the standard normal curve, so you want normal CDF for Z-scores and TCDF for T-scores, um, as the name implies. So Z always goes with normal or inverse norm, and T always goes with T-CDF or inverse T. Uh, and so keep that in mind. The names kind of give you huge hints as to that, but uh, that's definitely true. Or you could just use the T-test or the Z-test and that will compute these for you as well. So um, you uh, keep that in mind as you go through this test statistic. Um, you're computing Z or T, but if you do the T test and the Z test, that will compute that for you. So you could do those as an option on your calculator and it will easily compute these for you. And the t-test and the z-test will also compute the, the p-value for you. Um, so as you go to work this problem, uh, it will compute the next step for you too. I'm going to tell you if you want to compute the test statistic, you can pause here while you have these two formulas and compute the test statistic and then we'll go and pause on the step four uh, so you can compute the p-value. Okay, hopefully you paused there and computed some test statistic, and now we will move to the p-value with our example, and you can compute the p-value for this scenario as well. You'll need to use your test statistic um, and then draw a picture of it, um, of your test statistic, and shade the right area, like we talked about with the tails, um, and then you can compute it, or you could just do the t-test or the z-test, and it'll do all that for you, and you won't have to worry about it. So the calculator's pretty awesome there. Uh, if you don't want to draw your picture and do all of that t-cdf or inverse t or normal cdf or inverse norm, or, you know, it'll do it all for you. So pause right here and do that, and we'll come back and talk about both of these steps. Okay, so the T-score was the right answer. Hopefully that's the one that you went for instead of the Z-score. The reason is that we are given the um, sample standard deviation, so, uh, and not the population. We are not given the population standard deviation, more importantly. Uh, so we use the sample standard deviation formula, which is the T-score formula, and when I plug in, my sample mean was 71 inches, and remember that my null hypothesis was the 73 inches, um, and so 71, that's where 71 comes from, and the null hypothesis had 73 inches in it. Uh, and then 1.5 was the sample standard deviation, so that's why we see that here, and then 40 players was our sample size, and so that's why we see that here. And then when we plug all of this in the calculator, like I said before, don't forget parentheses around any complicated numerator and any complicated denominator so that it does the order of operations correctly, so you see all those 
um, important parentheses. Uh, and be sure that the parentheses is not under the square root. You can arrow over to get it out from underneath the square root. Uh, and then that will give me my test statistic, my t-score specifically here, uh, which is negative 8.43. Um, and I would say 3 if I'm going to if I'm going to round it, if I'm not going to keep the rest of these digits. Um, and I want to keep at least four significant digits on this one because I'm going to use the t-score to get the p-value, assuming I don't do um, the t-test. And actually, I am going to do the t-test on the calculator for you in just a minute, but I'm going to show you how to do it by hand first. This is, this is the by hand way of getting the t-score, the hard way, in other words, of getting the t-score. And here's the hard way of getting the p-value, and then we will do the easy way. Um, so uh, remember that my alternative hypothesis symbol was less than, and so that means I want to shade to the left, and my score uh, my t-score, remember 0 is going to be in the middle of the t-score distribution, uh, so that'll be 0 uh, as the mean of the t-score distribution, and so negative 8.433 would probably be much further to the left than I've labeled it here, um, but I wanted to, to make it so that we could actually see our p-value, even though we in real life we probably wouldn't be able to see it on this scale um, very much at all, because it would be all the way over here, um, and just so tiny. But, uh, so we want to use uh, TCDF because what we're trying to find is a probability. Basically what we've done is we've assumed that the null is true. Um, we've taken our data values and now we're computing the probability that we would have data that is as extreme or even more extreme than the data that we got. So if we collected our data at random, which we should have to be able to do this, we're saying what's the probability that we would have gotten the data that we got or even more extreme. And that's our p-value, and if our p-value is tiny, then our null hypothesis is probably not true. And if our p-value is huge, then our null hypothesis probably or is true, or at least it has a lot more likelihood of being true if our p-value is huge. We never say that it's definitely true, um, but certainly it has a very tiny chance of being true if our p-value is tiny. Uh, so to compute this, uh, TCDF, the minimum of the shaded region, um, is negative 1899, and the, um, then we put in our maximum of our shaded region, which is our t-score of negative 8.433, um, and then uh, we'll put in our degrees of freedom. We had 40 data values, and our degrees of freedom is n minus 1, so I just literally put in uh, 40 minus 1, n minus 1, or you could have been in 39. And then when I put all of this in the calculator, I actually did second answer because my previous answer was this stuff, and that kept more digits than negative 8.433. Um, let me show you on the calculator now. So uh, here is where I did that, and um, answer is right here, so you can just do second answer. Of course, if I did that this time, instead of negative um, 8.433, it's going to give me 1.2646. So um, it'll just give the previous answer. So, but let me show you second DISDR TCDF option 6. Uh, and now, if we're going to do it, since my previous answer is, is this answer, and that's not what I want, I will put in negative be sure to use the right negative, too, because it'll get mad if you use the minus. Um, 8.433, uh, and that's how we do that. Now, the easy way, that's one of the reasons I minimized so we could do the calculator. Easy way um, is stat, um, and you can scroll right once, or right twice, and or left once. Um, and get to the test menu. We want the t-test, again, because we have a sample standard deviation, not the population standard deviation. And we will select the stats option because we don't have the 40 data values. If we had been given the 40 data values and put those 40 data values into L1, then we would switch to the data option and we would use L1 and probably erase our frequency list or put a 1 here. It would either be blank or 1. I can't remember which, but... Uh, and then our, um, the very first input that we use is always going to be uh, 
the mu zero, so whatever is in your hypotheses, the data value that's in your hypotheses. Uh, and you can see I have 73 here. Our x bar is going to be our sample mean, and it says that right here. And then our sx is our sample standard deviation. 1.5 is where I got that. And then our n, of course, is our sample size. And then it also asks for the symbol, because remember, which way we shade on the p-value determines our symbol. And if we had shaded to the right, we would have had almost 1 instead of almost 0. Um, and so that definitely changes the value. So we want less than, and so you just highlight it and press Enter. Um, but you can tell I've already done that. And then calculate, and it'll give you the t-score and the p-value once you've put in all that stuff. And so you don't have to compute, you don't even have to draw a picture, um, it will give you all of this stuff. Now one thing to keep in mind is that this p-value is equal to area or probability. So to see a p-value of 1.26 um, should send off alarm bells. We have lots of p's in this course. We have um, p's for probability, and really this p-value is a probability, um, but it's a very specific probability. We have p's for proportion. We have p's for sample proportion. Um, it turns out uh, that it will get quite complicated in the next video on all of that, but all p-values, all things that are p, represented by the letter p, have to be between 0 and 1. So 1.26 is more than 1. That should send alarm bells off. What that's saying, what this is saying, E negative 10, is of course that we have to, I say of course, uh, some of you may remember this from future or past videos, um, is the E negative 10 means that we need to move the decimal to the left 10 spaces. Um, we move it once to the left and it gets in front of the one. We've got nine more times to go. In other words, nine zeros between the decimal and the one. Um, so point, the real p-value, if we wrote it out, would be point zero 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 one two six. Um, so that would be our answer, and that's going to be really, really, really tiny. Um, and that's as I would expect it to be, because this is a, a, a really far to the left t-score. Um, remember, almost all data values are between negative three and positive 3 on the z-score, and that's pretty much true on the t-score as well, especially with as many as 40 data values. That's close to true. And so now we've done step 1, step 2, step 3, step 4. We are almost ready for the conclusion. Uh, to decide our conclusion, though, I like to think of the Hamlet quote, to be or not to be, to reject or not to reject. That is the question. Uh, so I've slightly changed uh, Shakespeare. I hope he doesn't mind. But that is our question here, to reject or not to reject. And so here, if we have a small p-value, a tiny p-value, then we reject, period. Um, if we have a large p-value, then we do not reject. And always keep in mind that alpha, we're just going to assume it's 0 0.05 unless we're given the significance level. And if we're given the significance level, they usually express it as a percentage. So they may say 5%, and that's exactly the same thing as 0 0.05. So almost always you will use alpha of 0 0.05. Sometimes it will give it to you as 5%. Uh, sometimes it won't even give it to you, but you'll still use alpha of 0 0.05. But if it says 1%, or if it says 10%, 1% is 0 0.01, 10% is 0 0.10. Um, so you would use those when it does tell you a specific significance level. Uh, and then you take the P that you just got in step four and you compare it to your alpha. Here we weren't given an alpha, so that's a big hint as to what you might use. Um, and then uh, we decide whether we reject or not. So if we have a tiny P, like I said, then that means we will reject um, in our conclusion. And the conclusion is really not just the rejection statement. The most important Part of the conclusion is the conclusion statement. Um, and the, these are two different conclusion statements depending on whether you reject or not. And I've given kind of an outline for you, um, which, you know, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't, but this is kind of a model of how you could phrase. Now, you'll see different phrasings on, on different textbooks, and, but they usually do follow some sort of model. Uh, 
Ooh, I thought I'd underlined this. This should be underlined. I thought I'd done that. And it, look, it's not underlined there, though. Um, so the words in red will change depending on whether you reject or you don't reject. And of course, we, we want to have whether we do have sufficient data or don't have sufficient data to conclude. Um, and then I will be looking for the word average or mean. Um, somewhere, if you're doing a conclusion for mean, somewhere you should talk about the average or the mean. I will be looking for what your variable is, not the word variable, but what specifically your variable in your scenario is. I will be looking for a population description, or at least the word population. And Newton doesn't always follow this, but I think that you should always at least, at least, at least have the word population here because uh, some students misunderstand that this is for the sample instead of the population. So I need to know that you know that it's for the entire population. So we're not making conclusions about the sample. We don't need to make conclusions about the sample um, because we know 100% for the sample. So there's no reason to do a hypothesis test for the sample. We're 100% certain on what we collected on our sample. We are making conclusions about the population. Um, so that should definitely be part of your conclusion statement. And then the alternative hypothesis symbol and the alternative hypothesis value. Um, the symbol usually written out in words and the value probably not written out in words. And then the units, um, if there are units, should be given as well in your conclusion statement. So I will look for all of these things when I'm grading the projects and the discussions to to give you a sense, when you're doing Newton or when you're doing the exams or the quizzes, it will be multiple choice, but you should look for all of those elements to be in there as well. And the wrong answers will have um, the wrong elements in there. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. And so let's pause and do our, oh wait, no, we wanted to, to mention that it's a good idea to give the p-value because the closer you are to zero to give it in your conclusion statement, um, you don't have to, it's not an essential element, but the closer you are to zero, the stronger the p-value is. Um, and of course, the further you are from zero, the weaker the p-value is. Uh, sometimes, you know, alpha is usually 0.05. Sometimes I, I have seen textbooks go as much as 0.2. I kind of think that's ridiculously high. Um, but it, it's not unheard of to be 0.1. Maybe that would be more, more like here. So, but that would still be a lot weaker than 0.05. And then 0.005 would be much stronger than 0.05, of course. Um, and 0.0005 would be even stronger. So um, you get stronger the more you go towards zero here. And uh, this is sort of like a legal analogy. Uh, if you think about court trials, the jurors are told uh, that they need to convict only if they are sure the person is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And so if they um, are 60% sure the person's guilty or 70% sure the person's guilty or 80% sure or even 90% sure, if they were willing to bet um, nine to one odds that that person was guilty, but they weren't sure beyond a reasonable doubt, um, then that person is probably guilty, but yet they get the not guilty verdict. Um, and so the null hypothesis here is innocent, but not guilty is not the same thing as being innocent. And we see that all the time in today's trials, don't we, where um, a lot of people who are uh, probably guilty or almost surely guilty get off scot-free. And I'm okay with that because the uh, opposite is far worse. Um, the opposite is that we're, you know, we're not sure beyond a reasonable doubt that the person is guilty. And so that means more innocent people go to jail than go to jail nowadays um, who are innocent. So uh, you just, if you really got, you, you really want to be sure. And so that standard is definitely um, valuable. And that's why we have it as a standard for hypothesis test too. We want to be sure beyond a reasonable doubt. But it's also why we never, never, never accept the null as true because it's probably not true. Even if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, the null is probably not true. More likely to be false than to be true. 
And so we don't want to don't want to say it's true because it's almost surely not true, um, or probably not true. Most of the time, it won't be true. Uh, so back to our step five. We want to do the scenario, and if you want to pause now and choose which of these to do, and fill in the blanks too. Tell me. Um, which variable this scenario is talking about, what the symbol is, and what the units are, and all of that. Okay. Hopefully you've paused, and so uh, here is my conclusion statement. And I didn't cover up this completely because I wanted to kind of compare it. I did give this our p-value. So remember we talked about our p-value, and the closer it was to zero, the stronger it was. And look how strong ours is. Oh my goodness, it's just so many zeros. Um, so strong. So our p-value is tiny, 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 way less than alpha. And so we reject. We reject wholeheartedly. Um, therefore, we do have sufficient data to conclude that the mean height of high school students, so um, I have talked about have sufficient data to conclude. I have talked about mean height of high school students, so the word average and mean are basically the same thing. Um, I am talking about the population, and given uh, this scenario, it says the population is going to be our high school students who um, play basketball, um, and then height was our variable, um, and then the alternative hypothesis, um, oh, on the school team is still part of uh, the population description. And then uh, is less than is our alternative hypothesis symbol in words, and then our alternative hypothesis value is um, 73, and our units are the inches. And so I've got all of the elements in there, um, and I added as a bonus the p-value because that's always nice to know, um, to know how strong we can conclude. And we can conclude really strong here because that is some tiny p-value. Uh, so hopefully this gives you a nice big picture of all of the hypothesis test process for means specifically. Uh, we'll do proportions, and we'll probably go through it a little faster. Uh, there is a final, before we jump out of this video, um, a final important topic to discuss, though, the type 1 and the type 2 errors. So if we reject the null hypothesis, and it turns out that the null hypothesis, when we actually look at the whole population data, um, it turns out that the null hypothesis really was false, wrong, and we rejected it, then we made the right decision. So, yep, yeah, um, we rejected what was wrong, and that was the right thing to do. Um, and also, if we went through the hypothesis test process, and we failed to reject, um, and it turns out that the, alternate, uh, the null hypothesis is actually true, and we failed to reject it, that was the right thing to do, because it was true. We shouldn't re reject something that's true, and so that's another way to make a correct decision. But if we reject, remember we make that conclusion statement, yes, we can conclude, and if we're wrong about that, that's a pretty serious error. Um, I, I think in general we would consider this the most serious error, but sometimes there are situations where the type 2 error is um, the more serious of the two. Uh, so the type 2 error is if you fail to reject and you make that wishy-washy kind of statement, remember... Um, uh, so we do not have sufficient. So you're, you're saying you can't conclude anything here. We do not have enough data to conclude, so we're not concluding anything. So this is the wishy-washy statement on the fail to reject. Um, and if we fail to reject, uh, and we should have rejected because the null was actually false, um, that's less serious most of the time. Not always, but most of the time that's a less serious error, and, and it's always called the type 2 error when you fail to reject and it's false. So let's look at our scenario that we've been doing for all of the five steps, um, and I just included the, the final question here, and this was our null hypothesis, remember? Um, so if this is true, and we reject, which we did just reject, so if we had the data that we had, and we reject, um, and the null if we actually looked at the entire high school team um, of all students who play basketball and averaged all their heights, and it was exactly 73 inches, then we would have made a type 1 error by rejecting the null hypothesis. 
Um, so the sample that we would have taken would have been an outlying sample. Um, it would have been a pretty rare thing, um, and so we would have been wrong. And if our p-value was 0.05 or close to it, then we would be wrong 5% of the time. Our p-value was less than 0.1%, less than 0.01%, less than 0.001%. It was just so tiny that we were probably not wrong if our true if we had a true random sample. Um, then uh, if we average it all and it turns out that it really is less than 73 inches, then we have the correct decision. Uh, let's suppose though that we had a p-value of 0.2 and so we would have failed to reject the null hypothesis in that case. Um, if we failed to reject the null hypothesis and it turns out that the mean really was 73 inches, that's a correct decision. If we fail to reject with our alpha of, or our p-value of 0.2, we fail to reject, and it turns out um, that it really is less than 73 inches, then we would have made a type 2 error, which in this case would be less serious because we would have said, we're not really sure. We don't have enough data to conclude. Um, and so that is the, the type 1 and the type 2 errors and how they work. They are, they are hard. Um, certainly, I hope that your lecture notes will help you, uh, that this chart will help you in doing those, and um, but they, they are challenging. And then, as you work through your homework, speaking of homework, um, in the discussions and in your Newton homework and in your projects and your quizzes, hopefully you will be using the lecture notes, especially on that type 1, type 2 error stuff, um, but also your formula card and your calculator especially, especially, especially the t-test and the z-test. That'll save you a ton of time if you're using the t-test and the z-test. And then the textbook instruction and the Newton instruction um, will be helpful too. And you might need um, the uh, tables. So that might be helpful on one or two questions. You might ask be asked for the t-score and be given the degrees of freedom uh, and the area to the right. Uh, so you might have a pretty easy answer there. Or um, you, uh, if you're given a scenario like we were given, it's far easier to just use the t-test or the z-test for those. So uh, if all of this fails and you still have questions, please, please, please message me. This is definitely a challenging chapter. Um, eight and nine are, are the heart and soul of the course, but they're also the most challenging chapters in the course. So I am eager to answer your questions, especially on this chapter. And I wish you the very best of luck. I hope you actually enjoy this um, half as much as I enjoy hypothesis testing. I will be very pleased if you do. Uh, good luck!